on with our Bible study tonight. We're going to be in Acts chapter 11. As I said, if you were with me when we began at Facebook time, which is about the middle of March, uh, Easter had ended, uh, and then we started to say, well, what's next? And so I went to the Great Commission. I really enjoyed the Bible study on that. Then we went to the birthday of the church, the Pentecost. We talked about Peter's sermon. We went to the first hypocrites of the church. That was Ananias and Sapphira. We talked about the first martyr of the church, which was Stephen. Then last week, we talked about the conversion of Saul. Now we are reaching a place, and remember this, Acts is the only history book in the New Testament. It is such a pivotal time in the hearts and the lives, I guess, of all Christians everywhere because things transpire and things change, and the change begins in chapter 9, 10, and 11. Actually, I think we're in chapter 10 tonight. Whatever Peter's vision of Cornelius is, that's where we're going to be. But anyway, conversion of Saul. Peter's ministry is coming to a close. Now, he's not going to leave the scene. He's going to write a wonderful book. He's going to minister mainly to the Jews. And he's going to hang around where he is. But the Lord is opening up the gospel to the rest of the world. It's an exciting time. Going all the way to the time of the church of Antioch when there was not a single Jew. The first church when there was not a single Jew as a member of that congregation. And it was there that the name was given to the believers of Jesus Christ and the followers of Jesus Christ, Christians. And that name has hung on for all of these years. Uh, I want you to look at some scriptures with me before we get into Acts. I want you to go with me to 1 Chronicles 4, 9. Turn with me right quick, please. 1 Chronicles 4, 9. Say amen to God. And Jabez was more honorable than his brother. And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bear him with sorrow. And Jabez called on God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed, and enlarge my coast, and that thy hand be with me, and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me, and God granted him that which he requested. Now about ten years ago, this prayer gained no variety, and there were a lot of books written about it. But I want you to notice one little phrase that Jabez prayed that really should be the prayer of every Bible-believing church. Enlarge my coast. In other words, enlarge my borders. Make my borders larger so that I can reach more people. Okay? That's the transition that's going to take place in Acts chapter 10. Now I want you to look with me. Before we get to that, I want you to look with me at Leviticus chapter 11. I'm going to go backwards. Now Leviticus chapter 11 is one of those uh, Bible chapters that when you read through the Bible, you get to this and you kind of go blah, 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 blah. That's one of those chapters. But anyway... We're not going to read the whole chapter. We don't have time to do it. But here the Lord gives some dietary restrictions to his people. He says in verse 1 and 2, And the Lord spoke unto Moses and to Abram, saying unto them, Speak unto the children of Israel, Speaking of the children of Israel, saying, These are the beasts which you shall eat among all the beasts that are on the earth. And then he goes on and talks about the ones that shall not. In verse 8, Of this flesh shall you not eat, of their carcasses and you shall not touch. Okay? So that's what chapter 11 is all about. Then go over with me to Deuteronomy chapter 14 right quick. And look at verses 3 through 6. Thou shalt not eat any abominable thing. These are the beasts which you shall eat, the ox, the sheep, and the goat. 
the hart, the roebuck, the fallow deer, and the wild goat, and the powrick, that is the badger, and the wild hog, and the camrys, and every beast that parts the hoof and cleaves and the, and the cleft and, and the cleft into two claws and chews the cud among beasts that you shall eat. So the Lord laid down a dietary restriction for the people of God. Basically, there were four animals or animal groups that they could not eat. They were not allowed to eat camel. Okay? I don't know why I never had a camel. They all look hairy to me. They were not allowed to eat rabbits called hair. Did you know in the early West, you know, a lot of people survived off of rabbits, but they died at an early age because they did not know it at the time because no studies were made. But rabbits doesn't have <coughs> enough nutrients to keep the body alive. Doesn't have enough vitamins <coughs> to give the body a strength. And so they eat, they felt full, but they died at a young age because they ate rabbits. Well, see, God knew that way back then. And he said, oh, just because you sell them rabbits running around, there ain't no sense to shoot them. You can't eat them. So no camel, no, no rabbits, no pigs, and no badgers. Now, I ain't never eat badger anyway. But my, 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 have things have changed because the Baptists couldn't exist. We didn't need barbecue, right? So the pig, you know, was high on our list, but it wasn't high on God's list. And sometimes you wonder, you know, well, God didn't know what he's doing. And before the studies came out, you know, and about how pork clogs up the arteries of the body, and so maybe God was trying to just keep people alive. I don't know, but that's not the lesson tonight. I think it's worth noting, right? No, uh, noting, okay? Maybe, just maybe, you know, he didn't want to see pigs because of all the fat that pigs have and all that barbecue just ain't good for you. And everybody said, amen. amen. Now, with all that said and done, let me tell you, I confess that yesterday I tried my best to find an open barbecue place. I couldn't find one. They were all closed down. I don't know when they're going to back up. We're all going to die. They'll come again. Huh? They'll come again. Okay, it's too early in the week. All right, I'll go a little later in the week then. Maybe the ball's right. Surprise. See if I can find some barbecue. Yeah. All right, but anyway, that sets the stage for what we're about to look at. So now let's go over, and we're going to look at all 48 verses. And we're just going to kind of walk through Acts here and see what God is saying to the body of Christ. You have to remember now, Peter was a staunch Jew, okay? We're in chapter 10. Chapter 11 is when he takes the message of Cornelius' conversion back to the council. You see, councils were always existing back then too, okay? And so here, verse, chapter 10, beginning verse 1, just going to kind of walk through this, make some commentary along the line. The three characters in this story that we need to pay attention to, okay? Uh, first of all, the Lord. Maybe the Holy Spirit. Then there's Peter, and then there's Cornelius. Each one is playing a part. And as I said a moment ago, at the risk of being monotonous, this is a transitional chapter. Okay? Things are changing drastically. It's going away from just you and me, you know, that's all we're going to look at after anymore, to a whole wide world that needs to hear the message of the gospel. Okay? There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian Band. Now what that simply means is that he was a Roman soldier from the Italian army, okay? A devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. And he saw in a vision. Now, what I want to know, and I want to ask you the question, I really don't have an answer. I'm hoping maybe some of you can enlighten me. Cornelius was not a Jew. There was no relationship to him whatsoever to the Jewish faith. We, don't, we do know that there were Jews from all nations that came to Israel to worship God. But my question is, where did he hear about God from? Anybody have a clue? Or, or is it? Commonest those who where did he hear about God? It says he was a righteous man who worshiped God in his house. Okay? But where did he hear about God? He lived in the far regions of Italy. Okay? Now we know the gospel had spread to there. Judaism had no impact whatsoever 
on the Italians, especially the Romans. So where did he hear about God? Does anybody want to answer that? Verse 3 might have a clue. It might have been in vision. This may give you and I an indication of how God reveals himself to the heathen. Because there are people in this world who don't have Bibles, they don't have Christians, they don't have churches. But God has promised to reveal himself to every human being. Maybe it was in the vision. Maybe that's how he knew God. But he didn't know Christ. He wasn't saved yet. But where did he? Does anybody have a better solution? Where do you hear about God then? Robert, put you on the spot. Put me on the spot. I got There's a lot of people that, that were uh, living could spread out all over. So it could have could have heard it that way. I don't know. Okay. Uh, Jew, Jews, know, particularly, you know, they they shy away from the world, you know, unless you were going to convert to their way of life. You know, so they didn't really offer themselves out. But he was not a Jew. He wasn't. A, okay. Anybody else? All right. Let's go a little further. As far as my book says, God. Sent Peter to Canadians. Peter hadn't got there yet. That's what it says here. Canadians um, was a believer in Christ, but he was seeking God and he was definitely gender generous. Therefore, God sent Peter to tell Canadians about Christ. Yeah, but he hadn't met Peter yet. He was, uh, so, how did he know about God? He could have heard about God from the people he had to interact with. He's a, he is over a group of soldiers that are in the Israel Jewish area. So he could have heard from the... And, and that made him a God-fearing man. No, but he could... A lot of people pay attention to what people are saying, and it could have spiked his curiosity. And then when God came to him, he knew who it was, and he listened. Okay. All right, he saw a vision. Now, this is fulfillment of Joel that in the last days people shall dream dreams and see visions. About the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying, Cornelius. Now here is where it gets serious in his life. Uh, I don't think to this point he's ever had a visitation from an angel. But now an angel appears to him. Have anybody ever had an angel with angelic experience? You think an angel, you know, unaware we've done that. But I'm talking about that you really thought you were an angel. Anybody? Anyway, he ran into the angel here. When he looked on him, he was afraid. What is it, Lord? Now, he addressed the angel as Lord. Now, why did he do that? We don't know. And he said unto him, the prayers and alms are come up as a memorial before God. Okay? So, God recognized some goodness in, in Cornelius' life. Or he, he, he recognized the fact that Cornelius was worth saving. He says, it's come up as a memorial before God. He said, now I want you to send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. And he lodges there. His name is Simon. It's, uh, he's at the house by the seaside. He'll tell you what you ought to do. So there was something missing in Cornelius' experience. It wasn't completed yet. Okay? And he's going to reveal unto him what needs to happen. And when the angel spoke unto Cornelius, this thing doesn't die on me. Um, it's in and out. I don't know what's wrong with it. Well, it's out now. Come on now. Yeah, it is back on. Back on now. Okay. The angel spoke in the Cornelius and then was departed. He called two of his house servants, a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. When he had declared all these things unto them, he said to them, Joppa, on the morrow as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up about the, on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he, was, and he became very hungry, and he would have eaten. While they made ready, he fell into a trance. So Peter's having a trance experience. Cornelius has had a trance experience. And he saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knitted the four corners, let down on earth. Uh, Where is were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts and creeping things and 
fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Okay, now Peter knew the Bible. He knew what Leviticus said in chapter 11. He knew what Deuteronomy says in chapter 4 and 14. So Peter says, Not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. All right, so now Peter is a staunch Jew. He's connected to the dietary rituals of the Jews. But here God is changing him, and he's telling him that what I have made call clean, you cannot call unclean. Now, it has nothing to do with the dietary uh, supplements that he will eat. But God uses that as an illustration to him about when I clean somebody, he's clean, holy, and pure. I really think if the Bible's anything, it's relevant. And I think it speaks to every generation and every time period. And I think the fact that we're studying the Jews tonight accepting Gentiles into the faith is kind of like you and I getting over the hump of people who have different languages, different ethnicities, and it helps us cross the racial barrier. Because somewhere in our Christian life, we have to deal with the same question that Peter has dealt with, who's clean and who's unclean? You know, who's worthy of my fellowship? Who's worthy of church membership? You know, anybody can come in that door and walk down the aisle and we can vote on them, but then maybe we have a tongue in cheek. Yeah, well, maybe their life ain't cold pathetic. Maybe we just don't need to add them to our members. Maybe, you know, we're really not reaching the kind of people we want to reach. So Peter has a life lesson that he's learning right here about Cornelius. Now, why? Well, Cornelius was a Gentile. Somebody tell me how the Jews looked upon Gentiles. Hated. A little more. They were not fit. They had a prayer that they prayed before they went into the temple. I thank thee that I'm not a dog, a woman, or a Gentile. That was the prayer they prayed, you know. So there was a lot of prejudice in the hearts and lives of the Jews. Now, where did they get this? I'm sure they didn't get it from God. God is specifically talking about accepting food, but he never lumped people into the field of things that you can't accept and can't accept, right? So we have to grow in our prejudices and our biases, okay? Now, that's hard for you and I to do because I'm speaking mainly to a predominant white Caucasian congregation who grew up in the South, and you grew up in the same period that I did in the 60s, and you saw how <clears throat> color was treated differently than the whites. And hey, that Southern Baptists are just as guilty as anybody. I listened yesterday to the sermons that was preached at George Floyd's funeral. There was so much bad theology in those messages that you, you cannot imagine, and I don't want to even start tonight. But that's partly our fault because until 1965, the Southern Baptists would not allow a black into their seminary. Wouldn't do it. You had to get your education somewhere else. So we've grown up on a whole uh, pattern of people who have bad theology, but they have bad theology because we haven't taught them. Does that make sense? Here was Cornelius and here was Peter. Peter didn't think that any Jew could possibly be clean. No, 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 no. Wasn't going to happen. God, you, you, Jesus lived with the Jews for 33 years. He died a Jew. Okay? But he didn't just come to minister to the Jews. He came to minister to the world. Yes, sir. I can understand the prejudice that the Jews had because in the Old Testament they were instructed not to associate with the, the Gentiles because of their idol worship and, and all that stuff. And of course, when God told them they were the chosen people, that automatically built their pride up to the point that you know, most of them couldn't handle it. But they were instructed not to intermingle with the, the Gentiles. Marry, not to marry. Yeah, and, and of course, when but now when you you say mingle, the only way they made their livelihood was by 
about selling stuff to the Gentiles. So they, they were mingling with these said don't marry. That's well, what they I, said. I meant mixing the, the, the their religion and, and their and the yeah. social life of marriage and things. Right. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. So but they had how many years? Four or six thousand years of prejudice that God is going to try to change in one event. And that is the men of Cornelius. Okay. All right. Put yourself. Try. Try to put yourself in the position. You what, 69, somewhere around that? You you 70? I'm 71 September. Man, you get old. I know I haven't had that. But, but for 70 years, for 70 years, you have been the predominant class of people in the South. Correct. So how how could the Lord convince you to open your life and your church to people who don't look and think like you? So that's what and, and six thousand years, how God gonna change Peter and just like you said, God had all preached, you know, you know, the, you know, in Gentiles or, but he, he really didn't want them to spoil their religion, but they, you know, they spoiled it anyway. Okay. So so he's going to change everything that Peter believes. All of a sudden, what God cleans, you can't call unclean. And that is, the, that is the crux of this Bible chapter right here. He's spoken to him the second time. What God has cleansed, you can't call unclean or common. Okay? So I think verse 15 is really something that we have to let soak in. This was done three times. <laughs> So he's kind of like a, a Baptist trying to preach. He's got to preach this sermon three times to get somebody to listen to it once. Peter, he's like, come on, Lord, I got it. He said, no, you ain't got it. The three things has always kind of been something with Peter. Remember when they were down on the seashore? Spoke to him three times, three times. You know, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? What I clean, you can't unclean. What I clean, you can't call unclean. What I clean, you can't call unclean. Now, while Peter ducked out in, in himself, now, he, he's just in a mess. He's thinking about the Jews back home. And he said, if I if I go to Cornelius and preach the gospel and they accept it, what am I going to do? How, how in the world am I going to break the barrier and bring him into the Jewish uh, congregation or socialization, whatever? So by down in the vision within himself, Behold, the men which were sent in Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and, and stood before the gate. Now let me ask you a question. Who is this experience more important to? Is it more important to Cornelius or is it more important to Peter? And, I, and, I, and while you're thinking about that, you see how God had prepared both parties, one to receive the gospel and one to present the gospel. He does that continuously. Every time he prepares a heart to receive the gospel or the gospel message, he's preparing somebody to be a witness. That's throughout everybody's conversion. Look at Ananias, sent to Paul. And so now he's preparing Peter to take the gospel to somebody that he don't really know. He ain't never met him, but he just don't like him because he happens to be a Gentile. All right, so who is this more important to? Is it more important to Peter? Or is it more important to, uh, to Cornelius? I think it's equally important because this was the opening for the Gentiles okay. to learn about Jesus. But right. also it was an opening for Peter to realize okay. that it wasn't just the Jews that were... All right, so you, you just put yourself in a bad position, and here's why. When God tells us to witness, it is just as important for us to witness as it is for those people to receive. Because if we aren't outgoing in our witness, then we're not really walking with God, right? I say equally important. Okay, that's what I meant. If it's just equally important for people, then I say that. So I'll say more. But if he, so us witnessing is just as important to us as it is to people we witness to. Okay? It's the lifeblood of Christianity. And it's all revealed in the history of the early church. Okay. So he prepared Peter, he prepared Cornelius. Uh, where are we at? They both Huh? Correct. And who who's got the 
hardest road to hold? Probably Peter, don't you mean? Mm -hmm. The Christians got the hardest road to hold, not the lost person, not the not Cornelius, but Peter. All right, now when Peter doubted, we don't read that, and verse 18, and he called and asked where the Simon, which was surnamed Peter, was lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men are outside seeking you. And therefore, and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Now, he knows Peter pretty good. And so he says, Don't doubt, Peter. Just go. Just go, Peter. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am whom you seek. What is the cause which you are come? Now, he already knew that. He said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, one that fears God, has a good report among all the nations of the Jews, was one that warned from God by a holy angel and sent for thee into the house and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in the lodge. Now, remember, remember what we read a couple of Sundays ago. You know, how can they be saved without the gospel? How can they hear the gospel without a preacher? And this is just playing out. Somebody has to share the news. And Peter was that preacher. Then called thee him to them lodged there, where they lodged on the morrow. Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Okay? And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kinsmen and their friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Now, this is a common experience if you've ever been to a foreign country, okay? Because people in poor countries where their churches are not thriving and the gospel is not prevalent, for them to have more prestige than you because you come from a nation where the gospel is alive. And so the worship is real common. Now, I don't, I don't think he really was worshiping. He's just worshiping Peter because of who he was, who he represented. I don't think there's anything sacrilegious going on here. My opinion, he's just worshiping because he's coming from a prestigious place. And if you ever go to a foreign land, it will be the same. They will, they will bow at your feet. They will give you everything that you want. They will love you. They will make sure you're comforted because they are glad that you have come. They are glad that you have shown concern enough about them to leave your confines, your comfort, to go to where they are and sometimes risk life and limb and discomfort just to share Christ with them. So the worship is, that's what's going on here, I think. Uh, where are we at? 26. 24? 6. 24, 6. Yeah. Peter took him up, saying, Stand, I myself am a man. As he talked with him, he went in and found many that would come together. So it's not just Cornelius. He's got other people there, probably family members. He says, you know how it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come to one another of another nation. Okay? Now, where did he get that from? He got that from God. He got that from the Old Testament, just like Bruce was mentioning. Okay? You just don't keep coming to other nations. Why? Because you are God's people. You're God's apple in apple God's eye. You're selected. You're the chosen race, you know. But it's time for the chosen race to understand why they were chosen. And that is to be a catalyst of the gospel to the rest of the world. And the Lord is revealing that right now unto Peter. He says, you know, it's just not common for us to keep company. But God has showed me that what he has cleaned, I can't call unclean. In other words, we're all clean by the same blood. And we all walk the same way. And if Christ wants to save somebody from a different culture, we have to learn to accept them and receive them. Therefore call I, or came I, unto you without gainsaying, as soon as I was sent. Now that's a lie. <laughs> Peter didn't want to go. He said, I came right away. You know, people, he, he didn't want to say, well, you know, I really won't be here for a He said, God had to tell me three times, you know, just to get out of my house and come on back here. For what intent you have sent for me? And Cornelius said, well, four days ago I was fasting until this hour. The ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. Okay, now he's saying he's a man. Earlier he said he was an angel. 
Now, that might have been Luke's writing that, but he might have actually had a, a, a confrontation with Christ. We don't know. Some commentary will tell you that. They'll say, well, this man was Christ himself. Cornelius, thy prayer is heard. Thy alms are had in remembrance of thy sight. Send therefore to Joppa and call Peter, Simon, Peter. He's lodged in the house of one Simon of Tanner by the seaside. And when he comes, he shall speak to thee. Immediately, therefore, I said to thee, and thou hast well done, thou hast are come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Okay. Now, I didn't check the distance from Joppa to Italy. I don't know how far that was. But does anybody? Anybody know? But anyway, he, he made the journey, and he went. He said, I'm here. And all they're doing is rehearsing what's taking place up to this point. But something dramatic is about to happen that is further going to put Peter back on his laurels, okay? Now, God don't keep company with them kind of people, the Gentiles, you know. First of all, remember, if he was a Roman soldier and probably a leader of the Roman army, he probably done some pretty drastic and hard things in his life, don't you imagine? He had a band of men under him, so there's no telling what he had done in his life, you know. Just being a, a, a captain or centurion in the Roman army means that he probably had ordered people to do things that he shouldn't have. So there's some sin in his life that probably be confessed. All right, now we get down to the, 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 the nitty gritty. Verses 34 through 42 is what we really need to focus in. We're brought to this point. Peter opened his mouth and said of the truth, I perceive that God has no respect to persons. So God is showing that Peter's going to preach a sermon right here. And, and the title of the sermon is God is No Respecter of Persons. Now, if you were going to preach a sermon on God being no respecter of persons, what would your points be? How would you go about it? What would be your transition? What would be your intro? I'm putting you on the spot. I'm saying you get a good lesson or a Sunday, a Sunday school lesson on not being respecter of persons. What, what illustrations would you use? You might use Jonah, you know, going to Nineveh with the gospel. You might use Naomi and Ruth. You see, all of those were stories that illustrated that God still was concerned about the Gentiles. But on the whole part, those were just trickleers. They weren't, you know, they weren't never being part of the Jewish faith. But God is going to show Peter that this is not a Jewish faith. This is not a Jewish thing. So what he's doing right here, you see, it's very common for you and I. We have the Old Testament, we have the New Testament. Think about the day back then, they didn't have a New Testament, all they had was the Old Testament, it was in scrolls. And even to the early church, you know, they didn't have books, there was no such thing as binding a book, probably what, to a four or five hundred A.D.? So it was all part of one thing, but God is making a distinction here between the Old Testament and the New Testament, okay? The way he deals with things in the old and the way he deals with things in the new. That's why you and I are called New Testament believers. That's why this is known as a New Testament church. It is founded on the New Testament principles, a principle of grace and not law, that Jesus only is the way of salvation. That's the our basis of a New Testament church. In every nation, he is feared that him that works righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say you know which was published throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are his witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews, in Jerusalem, and whom they slew and hung on a tree. Him God raised up uh, the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. He has commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. So, Peter's sermon was very simple. It focused in on one person, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. 
His life, His death, His resurrection. Okay? Now, it is my presupposition that Cornelius had never heard this. Never heard the gospel. He knew about God. He may have known about the Jewish faith. He recognized that there was a great creator in heaven somewhere. But he'd never heard the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the same scenario that you find most of the people in the world today. I'm a history buff, and I've been watching the, the history of, of, of America, about Tecumseh, uh, General Jackson, Davy Crockett, Daniel Boone, and the war that they had with the Indians. Now, what they don't do is tell you where the American Indian came from. Now, if you believe the Mormons, they came from from uh, Israel, they crossed the Baltic Sea on that little barrier land, and they were all Jews. But all that said and done, whatever you believe about the American Indians, the American Indians had a knowledge of God. Now that's my point. They had a knowledge of God. They believed when they died, they went to the happy hunting ground. Now where did they get that knowledge? Anybody want to try to answer that? If they come from the Mormons, Mormon did a good job educating because, I mean, there's a big difference between the Jewish faith and the happy hunting ground, okay? But where were the American Indians originated from? Some actually believe they the lost tribe of Israel. But where were they originated from? They had a knowledge of God, just like Cornelius. So what did the American missionaries do? Men and women alike, felt called of God to go into the native tribes and preach Jesus to them. Some were slaves. Somebody tell me the most famous Indian ever saved. Geronimo. Huh? Geronimo. No, he might have came to know the Lord, but he's not the most famous. You ever heard of Pocahontas? There you go. Most famous in it. But you see, there had to be some kind of transparent, uh, transpiring there from the missionaries that came from a free, I mean, to, to, to come from a, a England to a free work and worship God freely. And God inspired their hearts. He said, there's people here. Well, these people have no knowledge of God. So God anointed missionaries. And, and by the way, most of these missionaries ended up dying. They were killed by the savages. They, they were trying to win. Happened to all the time. But they believed that God was sending them to carry the gospel to them. And some of them were saved and some of them were believed. Uh, see, that's the same scenario right here. Peter was going to some of his, his life wasn't great, but he was taking the gospel to somebody who knew God but had never heard of Jesus. He'd never heard the message of Jesus. Kind of like the American Indian. They knew of God. They knew about the happy hunting ground. And they had all kind of rituals about God. But they never heard the gospel story of how Jesus came from glory. Any questions? Judy's sitting back there like she's got a question. I think people know God through nature. Through his creation. Well, Romans chapter 1 says that. So whether you ever had a Bible or had the Jewish faith or any of that you would know God. That's why these tribes out in the jungle, yes, they can be saved because they know God through nature. That's correct. That's correct. Paul says the same thing. He said they have the sun and the moon as a witness to them that there's a creator somewhere. Okay? So they know there's a creator. Okay? So they knew about God. Cornelius had a little more knowledge than that. But anyway, these missionaries went and Peter went and faithfully presented Jesus. So that's the missing element. A lot of people know about God, worship God in their own way, but they've never heard the gospel, they're not saved. And so Peter preaches the gospel as simple, as pointed as you could possibly present it. There's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, what happens? Well, Peter's going to get evidence that the Gentiles have been added to the church. To him, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth on him shall receive remission of sins. When Peter yet spoke these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision, now that's the Jews, which believed were astonished. Remember, Peter took some people from Joppa with him 
They were all Jews. They were all circumcised Jews. And all of a sudden, they were astonished. God, the Holy Spirit has been given to the Gentiles. Now, there's one distinction here. Now, there were three times that the Holy Spirit was given in the book of Acts on this particular occasion with the evidence of speaking in another language. The first was, uh, was Pentecost, okay? Then there was another time when people, I uh, can't remember what it was, chapter 7, I think, where Peter went and, and they laid hands on them and, and they received the gospel and spoke in tongues to give evidence to Peter. And here's the third time. But the difference is this. There was no intermediator. Nobody laid hands on them. Nobody did anything. They just believed. And when they believed, the gospel came unto them. And the Holy Spirit came unto them, rather. And they gave the evidence of speaking with the same languages that was heard on the day of Pentecost. And that gave evidence that now the Gentiles had the same gift that the Jews had. So there can't be any more prejudice. Can't be any more. It's gone. They got the right to believe just like we do, and they received the same gift just like we do. So we can't say that, you know, it's just good for us. Now, it's bad to say, but this kind of thing goes on in the Southern Baptist. We think we're the only one that's got the monopoly on the Holy Spirit. We, we do revivals, you know, we, we got this going on, we see baptism and things like that. Sometimes we... But tongue-in-cheek, look on other denominations as really not being with it. So we have to learn, you know, that we're not the only ones. There are other cr groups, Christian groups, that have just as much of God as we do. And a lot of times they're doing just as much, if not more, than we are. Amen? Let's take them off for now. We didn't preach. All right, anyway. The Holy Ghost was given the evidence that the, they heard the same gospel spoke of that, had the same message in tongues as was heard on Pentecost, but they didn't have any laying on of hands. It just came automatically. So this opened up the door to what we have today. We don't lay hands on anybody to receive the Holy Ghost. When they believe, the miracle takes place in their heart without any intercession by human beings. All Peter did was preach. And when they believed, the gospel of the Holy Spirit came. Amen? They heard this speak with tongues or languages and magnified God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that they should be, not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? So the Lord did a lot of convincing that day. He convinced Peter with the vision and what God cleans, you know, remains clean, and he said, they get the same gift that you got. You can't say, I got more gifts than others. You can't do that. And by the way, there are denominations that do that too. They think that God gives them special gifts that other Christians don't have. That's not so. Okay? Everybody has at least one gift if you're a believer. Doesn't matter what church you go to. If you're a believer, you have the gift. You have a gift that the Holy Spirit has given you. So, the next thing, what's next? Good old Baptist. Baptism. Get them under. But now, notice the formula. Notice the steps. They were convicted. They knew they needed God. They heard the message of Jesus. They received the Holy Spirit. Then they were baptized. Sound like a good formula for me? I can't improve on it, can you? very first Gentile, right here. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then prayed they him to tarry a certain day. He said, Peter, I need to learn some more. Can you hang around a while? And so that was the transitional point. Going, leaving the Jewish faith and dividing the Old Testament from the New Testament. And a new day had begun that the gospel truly was of every human being. Hello? All right, I'm through. So you don't have any questions? Was it, you think the age of the first Gentile be that fast? Huh? The age of the first Gentile be that fast? I think so. You think there was no? Um, 
Ethiopian, was he, was he, what was he? Was he the Jewish faith? The people that worshipped the Jews, I kind of think that they, they were connected to the Jewish faith. But he was the first one who came from cold Turkey, Gentile. But, you know, no connection whatsoever to the Jewish faith. Because the Ethiopian had been to the temple to worship, so he already knew. There you go. That's, the way, that's a good way to explain it. Anybody else? Was there only the Jews at the temple on the day of Pentecost? They were only those of the Jewish faith, not, not Jews. There were people from all nations, okay? But they were the Jewish faith. In other words, they were Old Testament believers. They were circumcised, they were everything that was connected to the Old Testament. He had no connection whatsoever. So there wasn't anybody there that the Holy Spirit came upon on the day of Pentecost that were non-Jew. Faith-wise. Faith-wise. Uh, I don't know, you know, all these other nations, they were, they were, they could have been Jews living in other countries that came back. I, I don't really know about that. Does anybody know? I really don't know that. But I know faith-wise they were. I know it said the Holy Spirit descended upon all of them. And I, for some reason I was thinking that it was a little bit of a mixed group. Even though it happened during a Jewish festival. Right, right. So we might assume that it was all Jews. Yeah. There's Jews throughout the whole world, even today. There's nowhere that you can go that you can't find Jewish believers. And it might be that case. All right, I'm through. I'm going to turn this off. Thank y'all. God bless. Have a good night.